great pleasure to be here with all this, these great talks. Um, uh, I think the different, uh, so I was asked, to, the, the, the theme of the meeting was going to be the past, the present, and the future, and I was asked to represent the future. Um, and I did notice the latent variable. So back in the early days of statistics, people were ties. And then in the 60s and 70s, they got cool, the ties came off with just jackets. And then now the jackets are off. <laughs> Um, so Christopher Sims put his finger on what I think is actually the key problem of our era, uh, the next several decades, which is computation. Uh, so we've been very glib and complacent about computation. Yes, that it was remarkable progress to have the Gibbs sampler and so on and so forth. That allowed us to do things in some generic sense. But computation is about real time. Uh, that's what animals have to do, and that's what people have to do in marketplaces and businesses of all kinds. And real time is often microseconds, milliseconds. There's a time scale associated with almost any inference problem, certainly decision problem. And we're complacent about that, because we have these unknown constants, we have rates that aren't real rates, we have no lower bounds, we have mixing times we have no idea how to get our hands on. We just can't add computation in the current statistical theory, either frequencies or Bayesian. Um, so I can say that even more strongly if you want me to. Um, it's just really open. So the young people in the audience, uh, that's the area to be in. So in fact, I've been working on that for the past few years and have made some progress, but it's all frequentist. Um, so actually, uh, trying to work in the Bayesian paradigm and not knowing the mixing times of MCMG chains and so on and so forth has just been overly limiting to try to bring computation in. And opening it up to more ad hoc frequentist techniques that usually bring in optimization and so on and so forth has been helpful. Um, so I have some papers on that. In fact, I gave a talk at the ISBA meeting that was purely frequentist. People pardoned me and brought me, invited me back. I came to Duke and gave another talk that was frequentist. I'm not going to do that on the 250th anniversary of Reverend Bates. <laughs> um, so instead, I'm going to turn to a purely Bayesian talk. Well, there'll be computation lurking, but not as, as fundamentally as it needs to be and will be, I hope, in the future. Um, and so let me, again, um, be a little personal. Like some of the other speakers have been a little personal history, a little bit where this came from. Uh, so I was a professor at MIT at a place there is no statistics, a real aberration. Um, a little probability and, and, and a little statistics. Let's not say none, because I'm being videotaped. <coughs> but anyway, hopefully, historically, that aberration will be corrected, and maybe Steve can help us think that through, how it should happen. Um, so anyway, I was, I was also not married at the time. I spend my evenings in bars in Central Square um, reading statistics books. Um, so I listen to punk rock music and drink and, and read statistics. I just had a great time. And one morning, I woke up a little hungover, trying to remember who I was, and I realized I'd been reading DeFinetti. I realized that I was a Bayesian statistician. <laughs> In fact, I realized I was an Italian Bayesian statistician. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I did is I learned Italian. Um, and then I learned more statistics. And the main thing I started to think about was where am I going to deploy this Bayesianism? What domain of science, technology, whatever, math, uh, is the best place to start to make impact and to show that these ideas have the power that we all know they have. Um, and I didn't think it was to go to all the problems the frequentists were already working on and try to do a little bit better than the frequentists. I just didn't appeal. All right? So I thought, what areas, what problem domains are there um, where uh, Bayesian tools are going to actually be unusually appropriate? OK, so um, uh, the area is called information retrieval. Back in the early to mid-90s, when I started working on this, that was not a well-known term, it's probably more well-known now. It was a field by then, by of course. Um, and it considers documents as data. Right, so there's a couple of documents I just sort of randomly got off the web. What does it mean to consider a document as data? Um, well, it means all kinds of things. It could mean to you know, really analyze the document deeply in a semantic sense like a human does. That could be an analysis of a document. That's what we really eventually want to do. But it can also be something much more superficial and kind of Keyword matching, that's sort of the, you know, eliminating other stream. That's what the field information retrieval started to do. Um, now, how did I find those documents on the web? Well, I typed, I typed some keywords into Google. And they found, by an inferential process, those documents. Well, that's, that's a good example of the kind of thing that we're starting to see in our era that, you know, 20 years ago or so was not that common. Um, so let's think then about documents as data. Um, so statisticians really hadn't thought much about documents as data. Right? It's not a vector. It didn't have a fixed set of fields, fixed length. It's not a time series. Uh, in particular, the kind of 
dependencies nearby in time, you expect in time series, just aren't true here at all. The first word and the last word of the document can have a great deal of dependence. Okay? So it's really a collection of discrete variables, each which have a huge range. Each entity, each word in a particular document could be one of tens, hundreds of thousands of entities. Okay? Very unusual problem. So we have huge sparsity issues just at the outset. We have long range dependencies, and we have much latent structure to see the least. There's all of syntax and semantics and human knowledge in a document. And that's the, that's latent. We don't see that as a, an, analyst, an analyst. All right, so pretty interesting domain. All right, now we're not trying to model a single document. That's not statistics. We're trying to model a corpus of documents. Um, and so instead of trying to model a deep read of a corpus, which you know in hundreds of years we may really do, let's try to model a non-deep read. Think of a lawyer scanning a corpus of documents, looking for something to be useful in a patent case or something like that. Someone brought me an espresso. Very very kind person. Um, so anyway, that perspective existed and is known is, is what was led to the field of information retrieval. And if you went to Google in the early days, in the 20, in the 20 years ago, all the books in the shelves were either Java programming or information retrieval books. Those are the fields that drove the development of places like Google. Now, if you go there, they're all statistics books, by the way. It'll be amazing. All right, here's some of the inferential problems that arose in information retrieval. They didn't really use the word inference. They weren't really statisticians. But these are inferential problems. Here are some keywords, find me some relevant documents. Here's a document, find me more such documents. Here's an image, um, find the, um, label the image, or find more such images. So a document doesn't have to be just words. It can be another kind of entity, like an image that has patches that can be thought of as words. Uh, what are the topics that underlying this document collection? That starts to feel like a latent variable inference problem. Classified documents and printing topics, and so on and so forth. I could keep going on and on and on. So these won't have to do with deep semantic understanding of the documents. They're very clearly interesting inferential problems that you could solve based on data, okay? and are being solved. Um, so by the late 1990s, when I started getting, getting interested in this problem, it was already an undeniable sex, sex story, and the search engines we're familiar with were based on these ideas. Um, and uh, they were empirical, thoroughly empirical. That was sort of good. They, worked, they developed working procedures. So one of them was known as TFIDF. It's, it's a term frequency inverse document frequency, a way to transform a document in a, in a, in a with a ratio that turned out to be very useful, the discovery entirely empirical. Uh, occasionally, there was sort of conditional probabilities flying around and marginal probabilities and, and p-values and so on, so forth, but it was really a thorough model. Okay, now I am on videotape, so I don't mind saying that, however. It just really, they, they got the conditional probabilities all messed up. It wasn't clear what was conditioning on. There was incoherence. Uh, it was really a model. And, and really, it was the problem of frequent statistics. So they were sort of reading stat books and pulling stuff out of it. Um, and so, you know, from my point of view, frequent statistics is actually great in the hands of experts. It gives you a lot of insight. It is, drives analysis. It, it drives insights into the kind of procedures that might be useful. Um, but it's not, and, and the tools it develops also can be quite useful. So all those should be used with care by communities. However, this community used those tools without the understanding of mine, and they, and they developed a, a model. Okay? That, that really held back um, thinking for quite a long time. Now, there were some uh, sort of tried and true statistical pieces of methodology were being deployed, mixture models, as I'll talk to you about in a minute, and principal component analysis were uh, being used in interesting ways and still are to this day. Um, but there was not a kind of a general toolbox being developed, uh, and particularly not one that was Bayesian. Uh, so there was clear ample room sort of in this domain with these unusual data structures and interesting inferential problems. Um, it was a great domain is a, you know, to try to get into from an applied point of view. And I should say, I believe there are many other such domains. It's a recipe for interesting research. So we started working on this um, at that period, and through a sequence of very bright grad students um, have, have had a number of I think, interesting, maybe influential papers. Here's an example of one of the later papers, an analysis that was done on a particular corpus. Um, and I'm afraid you're not seeing this very well. Um, but this was an analysis of a bunch of uh, articles in the um, Journal of the ACM, American Computing Machinery. So it's a bunch of articles about computer science. Uh, and this is a model. And actually, this is a Bayesian approach. So this is a map estimate of a model. Right? And so these nodes in the graph are topics. And a topic is a distribution on the vocabulary items. I'm just showing the map distribution and only the first few items. All right? And moreover, this is a non-parametric model. The edges are all inferred. And the branching and all that is being inferred, and it's open-ended. 
Okay, so a pretty rich, interesting model. And it does really interesting things with this corpus. I mean, it takes all the function words and puts them at a sort of central node. Now, the model of a document, to elaborate a little bit here, this is just a representation of kind of the, the semantic entities, if you will, that are in the corpus and how they connect up. A document is a path down that tree and then a selection process around the path repeatedly. That's, that's in this particular case what the model of the document is. So a document would always use the root node, which has D and 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 of there, a pretty good place to put words like that. All documents will use that repeatedly. Okay? But then it'll go down a path, and you sort of sort of see it around the root node, there's other nodes which are pretty generic. Like there's algorithm, time, log, bound. There's logic, program, systems, language. Um, and so on as you go around. And those really look like a curriculum in computer science at the high level. And if you go down below that, you start to see more specific words that are, that are more um, less high frequency and more specific to the domain. So it's an interesting browsing tool at minimum for a corpus, but it also does lots and lots of inferential things of the kind I was alluded to on the previous slide. All right, so I'm going to kind of build up to this by the end of the talk, tell you a little bit more about how you do this, what's good and bad about it, you know, but really what are the conceptual issues that you have to face to think about corpora in this way, and then what it leaves on the table, what's not being solved by a model like this. I should, be, I should also add this is being done now throughout industry, um, sort of all big companies have topic models as part of their, their um, capability. Um, all right, so I can't resist this slide. There was a little bit of mention of sort of assessment early. Um, so, you know, some of the papers I've been most influenced by appear here, uh, and these are citations according to the Google Scholar. Um, so, uh, you know, 1974, uh, citations for the classic Lindley and Smith article, Dale Fenn and Smith, you know, quite a large number. Uh, my favorite textbook is Jim Berger's second edition, which has quite a respectable um, citation rate. And just to calibrate, to show that we're being Bayesian to calibrate, um, you know, there's a non-Bayesian article, which doesn't have, has about roughly the same number of citations. Um, you know, so this is pretty respectable to be cited this much at this, at this particular point in time. Um, and if you add one more, this is this paper on it, the first topic model of molecular like share allocation. In 2003, it's been cited several thousand times. Uh, so why do I put it up there? Um, not to brag at all. Um, well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> um, but you know, none of you would have probably put that article on your list of the most influential Bayesian papers, but it has some right to be there. And the interesting thing about it is it's an applied paper. It's a model for a domain, all right? You might have thought that Bayes would be, here are the foundational principles. There's a few papers on that. There's some axioms. Um, here's some generic procedures, a few papers on that, and everything else is case study. That's kind of a caricature you get of Bayes. That's where certain Bayes, where it's frequent as hell, it's a little bit of, you know, all this analytical work to do in every little domain. All right, and this paper is a good example of why that's just not the case. And you develop a very simple but useful general model, and people perceive in that model usefulness for many, many other domains, and perceive it as a way to build other complicated models. Every model is not unique. All right. You might ask, is that the most cited Bayesian paper, by the way? And that's not the case. Geeman and Geeman has 15,000 citations. I was disappointed to see. <laughs> but 1984. All right, so there's the model. Uh, it's really one of the simplest models I've ever worked with. Um, it's been a big success. It's a little simple tree model. So these plates and skies, the fact that it's a tree. Um, this is a graphical model representation. Um, and uh, the observed data are the words W there. Um, sitting above them are allocation variables. And sitting above that is a Dirichlet distribution that gives you probabilities for the allocations. And the alphas and the thetas are, are underlying uh, parameters that are being given distributions as well. So it's thoroughly Bayesian and really, really simple. Uh, it's a tree, so the inferential procedures are really simple. Uh, but it's being applied now on scales of millions and tens of millions, so there's really lots of nodes in these trees. Uh, and the Bayes deals very nicely with all the sparsity issues that arise in that set. And another diagram of this um, is the following. There's a couple of there's a couple of interlacing simplices that are in this model. Um, one of them is the probability set of probability distributions on the vocabulary items, the words. And that's the outer simplex. So a point in that simplex is a distribution on words, what we call a topic. Okay? And then it's a hierarchical Bayesian model. At the next stage, there's a distribution on topics. So there's an inner simplex, and a point on that is a document, which is a distribution on topics. And then you put a distribution on that, and you've got your really simple little model. 
right? And that was developed in the early 2000s. Uh, and you know, lots of related things have been developed, and it's not, there's no really great discovery here, but it's turned out to be extremely useful. Uh, so it had a little bit of a history in IR literature. If you pick up that literature, even to this day, you read a lot about bag of words models. They don't really mean a model. It's not a real model in our sense, but it's sort of a way of thinking, a bag of words model. And all it means is that the order of the words in the document are to be ignored for the purposes of all the queries I was talking about earlier. Okay? So that sounds like something familiar. And I had been reading DeFranetti, and then I started reading this information retrieval literature. I said, well, don't they just mean exchangeability? And yes, they do. But they had never noticed that. That connection had never been made. Okay? Um, so our article was the first one to point out bag of words just means exchangeability. And therefore, we should start to be thinking about um, exchangeability seriously. Um, now, some of the papers took the statistical point of view on bag of words models. And just again, to kind of bash this literature a little bit, they would say things like, we model the words as IID based on our assumption of a bag of words model. Mm, serious confusion. All right, so I started giving talks to this community, and the next few slides are taken from a talk around that era, where I was trying to prod them toward Bayesian thinking. So I said, okay, oops, I don't want to say that yet. I said, I said the following, let's play the little prediction game. I've hit a document right here, and I want you to predict the first word in the document. All right, it's a bag of words, so I'm not trying to model all the syntax and all the complicated um, sort of linear dependencies, but you know, I want to model some dependence. Right, so you know, I ask you to guess the first word, and you know, people would then guess P. I'd say, nope, that's not the first word. The first word is soleil. All right. Immediately, your distribution shifts drastically. The next word is not duck or chair. The next word is a French word. So you know, huge dependence. There's not IID here at all. All right. People found that puzzling, but you know, okay, let's keep going. I said, the next few words are plage, or the next two words are plage and vol, and now what's your next word? Now, if you know a little bit of French, you might start to realize this is about vacations, and you might start to have a vacation-related word. And this will go on for a while, and you'll start to learn a great deal about the person who wrote this document, and the purpose of this document, and so on. Okay, it's a lot of semantics, even though we're doing something exchangeable. Okay? So people found that kind of appealing, I think. And then I'd say, well, if you really believe all that, you have to learn about something called DeFinetti's theorem. So then I would put up this on the board, or on the slide. Uh, and even in those days, it was sort of, you know, no density, it was correct. It was a real, you know, measure theoretically appropriate distribution. They hated me for this. Because this just seemed like godly goop. And I want to tell one anecdote about this, which is I was also in that same time involved in starting a lab at Berkeley, where there was collaboration between statisticians and, and computer science systems people. It was called the Rad Lab. And uh, so there was a bit of hue and cry about that we had gotten a lot of money out of the industry to fund this. And so the New York Times sent someone by to interview us and take some photographs. And, and it was an article from the New York Times. Uh, so we were in a room being arranged for this photo. And they said, well, why don't you stand next to a whiteboard? And uh, fine. And so can someone write an equation on the whiteboard? And my systems colleagues looked at each other. They just didn't have a lot of equations in mind. Um, so I, they, I asked me to write an equation. So I wrote up Schrodinger's equation. <laughs> one of my favorite equations. And he said, that's great. Wow. So what does that have to do with the, the Rad Lab? And I said, well, not very much. Um, and I said, well, can you write a different equation? So I wrote a Bifanetti's equation. And I, and I said, argue that has a lot to do with where we're going in the future. And they said, great. And then so they put my colleague next to the equation and explained it to me. My colleague had no idea what that P means, but he was explaining it. And that picture appeared in the New York Times. So Bifanetti's equation. <laughs> did appear on the whiteboard in the New York Times. And I got a lot of congratulatory mails from many of you around in the room after that happened. Anyway, uh, so anyway, this equation suggested to people why it might be interesting to study underlying random elements G, and G needed to be pretty complicated to capture all of human knowledge, because documents can express all of human knowledge, and that's what G is doing. All right, and so um, we would then argue that you really need to take the phonetics seriously and find latent representations for documents. All right, so they already had a little bit of this. They, had, they knew about finite mixture models. Uh, so the game here was that a document would come in, and you'd like to say what topic that document was. Is this a document about sports, or travel, or finance? And you can imagine the business models behind that kind of capacity. And they use kind of machine learning technology here. That have a set of topics and a classification of that. And they, in particular, would use what were called naive bays, or basically mixed, finite mixture models for this. 
Um, and so we, we uh, were aware of this and pointed out there's a problem with this, which is that each document can only be about one thing. It could have a topic about sports, but not about travel. It had to be one of the, you know, it was, it was a mixture of yeah. All right, so they said, well, we were aware of that. Uh, so here's how we handle that, no problem. Uh, so this is just a list of the topics and the words in the topic. This is, this is not a graphical model, it's just a representation. So if a document came in that was about, the document was two words, Lakers win, that's a sports document. All the words in there are sports words, no problem. Uh, if the document was medical breakthrough, it's a medical document. Um, stock prices rise, etc. What if the document was player injured? Well, there's a sports and medicine topic, and it fits there. All right? Injured player not re-signed. Well, that's a medicine, money, and sports topic. All right. So you kind of see the problem. All right. So we said, well, there's this other way of thinking. It's called admixture models. And we were aware at that point that there had been this parallel development to the work we had done. In the genetics literature, talking about each human being being not, not a particular pure genome, but an admixture of genomes. And the same kind of ideas have been developed there. So, um, so um, you know, we also noted that um, this leads one toward a Bayesian perspective because you're going to have now a distribution on mixing proportions for an individual. And so that sort of seems Bayesian. You have distributional distributions. Okay. And let me also acknowledge that there were parallel developments at Rocheva. Uh, Colleagues working at CMU on social networks were motivated to go in this direction. Pritchard, Stevens, and Donnelly uh, in the genetics literature developed um, essentially an isomorphic alpha method to model to the one we developed, a little bit different. Anyway, that model looked like the following. A document would come in, and if it was just a pure sports one, well, the probability of choosing the sports topic would be large, maybe zero on the others, and so on. But you could also have um, probabilities on probabilities that could be, say, half on sports and medicine. So, um, so on and so forth for these things. All right, so that's the LDA model. Um, so uh, this model is just a admixture model. It just treats each document as a mixture. And so every word comes in, it can be assigned to one of a number of topics. By the time you've done that through the entire model, you've assigned, you've done some allocations of each words to topics, and you have a blend of topics in the thing. That's all that's really happening. But now if you go to the next document, you want to have make sure that there's some statistical shrinkage between the two. You want the documents to be related. So it starts to have to become hierarchical. Right, so that was kind of the thinking that went into this LDA model. So I'm not going to get into any more details. That's sort of some history. Um, but let me just tell you about some of the limitations that came up from the very first talks on this that people were pointing out. First of all, how many of these were practical people? How many mixture components? And you would wave your hands about BIC or marginal likelihood and all that. That just didn't do it for them. They just couldn't compute those things, and it seemed complicated. And also, we didn't know what priors to put on these things with you know dimensions of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. And, so on. It just really was a practical, difficult problem. Um, so moreover, the, the, you know, the mixture model, K, is kind of the one thing that's, that holds for every entity. Here we have multiple documents, each of which is a mixture. And so somehow K should be like a union of all the topics that all the documents can be expressed. It's a little less semantically clear what that is and how to penalize it, how to think about it. All right. Even more serious problem was the notion of abstraction hierarchy. We really were not satisfied with staying with these very simple models. We wanted to start to move towards more complicated models that capture more human knowledge. We wanted to analyze the document deeply. And sort of minimal kind of things we wanted to do was have notions of abstraction. There are frequency, high frequency words like of, and, and the. And there's generic words like statistics and so on. And there's specialized words like generalized linear model and so on. As you go down, we'd like to organize that, at least, to start to learn more about our corpus. And these models just weren't doing that at all. Every topic would come out and have the word the and an of in it, every single topic, because every topic had, if you had a pure sports word and you didn't have any mass on the and an of, all right, that sports topic, uh, sports topic couldn't have the word the and an of in it. All right, and you get zero likelihood, predictive likelihood for that for being a sports document. Right? Even if you smoothed and added epsilon and so on, it just didn't work. You needed to, so we needed to think about this issue. Okay, so the first issue was, you know, how many mixture components? Well, we did learn and know about. Um, Bayesian on par metrics in the, in, in the day, and we knew about traditionally processed mixture models. Um, you know, so there's just a couple of diagrams to refresh your memory if you haven't been doing on par metrics for a while. The graphical model, some representation of the distributions, and then the, the, the equations. Um, all right, so we said, well, we could just replace wherever there's mixture model, we'll put in traditionally processed mixture model. All right. All right, and so um, just to remind you, I'll tell my story a little bit, I need to remind you that if you marginalize out the Dirichlet process and ask, um, you know, so there, there's my, my little sticks of my little uh, discrete distribution up there are my topics in this language. Uh, they're in a one-dimensional space there for this uh, slide to make sense. 
And I'm going to pick one of those tops that's probably proportional to the height of that atom. And having picked that, then I'll generate a word under, under some distribution, not Gaussian, actually, multinomial. Um, and um, uh, the, you know, after having picked a topic for the first word, there's some probability of picking the same topic for the next word, and uh, so on. And then if I do that over all possible choices of G, you get what's known as the Chinese restaurant process. And so that's this process where the in this case, the words for a document come into a restaurant. They sit at a table uh, and uh, with probably proportional to the number of other words already sitting at that table. And so the top, uh, topics are now uh, mapped to tables. And the, the, uh, the, the usual DP mixture or Chinese uh, restaurant process mixture uh, grows the number of topics um, as, the number of, as a function of the number of data points. It's a logarithm. Um, so anyway, that was all there. So we said, well, okay, we just got to glue together two ideas. Our favorite idea in Bayesian statistics is hierarchies. And we just got to make hierarchies of these things because we all, we all knew about Stein and so on that if you had a bunch of separate problems, uh, empirical Bayes tells you, told you both in practice and in theory that it might be better to link them. And Bayes was the way to link things. Uh, you made all the parameters realizations of underlying random variable. So we said, great, we just do this. It's easy. So just to remind you of my graphical model notation, that diagram there is the one on the bottom of the page to be shortened to the upper page, uh, up, upper diagram on the page with these plates. All right, so we proposed and thought about the following little model that we had now multiple Dirichlet processes, G, I, and we were just going to link them by being reflections of an underlying parameter, which is now this distribution H. So we now draw, you know, it's the same as the empirical base picture. All right, and this fails entirely. This doesn't do at all what you'd like. Because for document number one, you come in, you start generating a certain topic. You know, I'm learning about the travel topic, because the travel document. I get high probability on certain travel words. Okay? That's one of those little bump atoms on the left-hand part of the diagram. All right, the next diagram over is the next document. All right, with probability one, it has no atoms in the same locations as the previous document. So the prior puts no mass on sharing of atoms among documents. Okay, big problem. We couldn't get any share. We can only get really rough sharing of the location parameters or the you know the the concentration of this of the uh, the uh, of the probabilities assigned to the atoms, just kind of classical parametric sharing, no, not good enough. So anyway, I told you know, my little anecdote here is that I was I just arrived at Berkeley a couple of years before, and went to one of my colleagues and said we have a problem. You know we're trying to put non-parametrics together with Bayesian hierarchies. And it's just kind of problematic. It's not kind of going together. He says well you should have known better. You know, Diaconis and Friedman showed long ago that you can't do Bayesian non-parametrics. It's just hopeless. Um, so I said, ooh, I better throw away that grant proposal and think of something else to do. Um, all right, well, we thought about it a little bit longer and realized that the solution here was not to back away from Bayes at all, it would be more Bayesian. All right, and the solution was really simple. You just added another level of hierarchy. So this became what's called the hierarchy of the Richard process mixture, um, which is now you generate the mother of atoms itself as a Dirichlet process. Okay, so you generate one mother Dirichlet process, which now has a bunch of discrete atoms, the topics, for all possible documents. Right? And each, each document is a draw off of that. It uses the same atoms and reweights them. So now you get sharing in the prior among, topic, among documents. Okay, so um, that was that story. And then there is an object called the Chinese Restaurant Franchise, which generalizes the Chinese Restaurant Process, um, where each document is now its own restaurant. And when a customer comes in and starts a new table, um, they pull down a uh, topic from the global menu, and every other customer sitting at that table uses, uh, inherits that same um, topic. And you can also then, in the top table, um, generate a new topic as a function. You sit at a, you, you pick a, a topic at the top um, menu as a function of the number of other choices of that uh, topic throughout all the restaurants. So that's how you can get the tying and the sharing among all these restaurants. All right, so this is a thoroughly, you know, a, a hierarchical sharing, uh, statistical shrink borrowing in a non-parametric framework, and it really does help a great deal with uh, this document modeling problem. We're handling open-ended numbers of topics and sparsity, and doing this in a clean Bayesian way. Um, all right. Eventually, however, the number of clusters we had this kind of problem. The number of clusters getting to be too large. Um, you know, it just became unmanageable, both statistically and computationally. And um, so instead of thinking about clusters as, as um, exhaustive and mutually exclusive, you'd like to think about them like features. Like, so um, 
you know, Ed and I share certain things in common. We're both Bayesian statisticians, but he lives in Philadelphia, I live in Berkeley, and et cetera, et cetera. But there's a long list of features that we share. And the total number of clusters that we could follow in is the power set of those features. If they're binary, if there's m of them, we get two of the m clusters. And that might be a more compact way to model the notions of topics and sharing. Okay? And so we thought about what other stochastic processes are there rather than things like the Richley processes that will allow this. And again, again, I'm, re I'm getting into this a little bit just because this was motivated by the applied problem domains that we're working in. This came right out of trying to think about things about like the document modeling and scale. Um, and so this led to uh, Indian buffet process by uh, Griffiths and Garmani, and then in our work, the beta process. And the link was, again, DeFinetti, as usual. Um, if you enter out the beta process, you get the Indian buffet process. And um, uh, again, I'm not going to get into the details there, but just, again, to uh, um, assert the primacy of the applied problem for, for generating these kind of ideas. Uh, and having done, think and thought about the beta process, it was as natural to then build hierarchies of beta processes, and that's still an area of interest to me for things like dictionary modeling. Okay, so that was the, um, sort of uh, where Bayesian non-pair metrics came into this problem. I still think that we have still fallen short of the exploitation of Bayesian non-pair metrics in these problems, and it's largely computational. Uh, we have to appeal to MCMC algorithms, and at the scale that we're talking about, they just run too slowly for people in the industry to care. So you'll come and give a talk about this thing in industry, and um, at the end of it, they'll say, great, that seems really amazing. You can do you know, power laws also. You, you can talk about you know, the number of topics emerging slowly over, you know, you know, so on, so on, that sounds all great. How do you actually fit this to data? And you say, well, we got a great give sample or whatever, split merge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a long list of computational topics. They say, well, can you give me any guarantee that it'll run in a few milliseconds, which I need, you know, to serve up a search, you know, search query or whatever. And I say, well, no, we can't tell, tell you anything about that at all. And then they just walk away. All right, so uh, really we have, we can't be complacent about this issue. All right, I'll get back to that in a little bit by the end of the talk, but again, I, I make it open, make it just open. So the uncle and audience, that's where we're, that's where we're falling down. Um, and leaving lots of opportunities for the frequency to fill our place. Um, okay, so the other one that I want to, I want to get to a little bit, um, again, no equations, trying to do this out of pictures, um, is this notion of abstraction hierarchies. Because eventually we don't want to just model things in terms of counts and you know, simple mixtures and so on. We want to start to get towards human knowledge. That's what we're after, at least I think, as statisticians, about trying to interact with our models like humans do in terms of real concepts and real semantics and relations and things like logic and so on. That's where we're really heading, I think. And so here's one step in that direction. As I alluded to earlier, um, these admixture models don't capture the notion of abstraction hierarchy. They don't have abstract words and concrete words. They just don't, don't do that. All right, so how might we try to do that? And again, still, Thinking in terms of definite. Um, right, well, one way of thinking about this is to, to, to go to another motif instead of hierarchies, uh, nesting. This has been less explored, certainly, than hierarchies, um, but has its own virtues and promise. Um, and so, nested models, um, it's a divide and conquer way of thinking. Um, instead of atoms being shared, atoms are split up, subdivided into smaller collections, and then you select among the collections. Okay. So it's really a divide and conquer. And so two prominent versions of this are the nested Chinese restaurant process that my colleagues and I worked on, and the nested Richley process. I think all three authors, I believe, were in the room about that. Okay. And both papers came out somewhat simultaneously, and both referred to each other, but sort of said something seemingly related to being done here that's not clear what. And of course, what's clear, if you're thinking about a little later, it's just DeFinetti again. If you integrate out the nested DP, you get the nested CLT. That's one of the beauties of working in this non parametric field. It just integrals. It just, it, 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 and, you know, beautiful constructions, combinatorial constructions come out of taking integrals. Um, anyway, let me just tell you a little briefly what this nested Chinese restaurant process is. It's a way of abstraction hierarchies. Uh, so here's a little tree diagram uh, where every blue square there is itself a whole Chinese restaurant. Okay? Um, and so, um, a customer's gonna come into the root restaurant, always starting at the root, goes into that Chinese restaurant, Selects a table to sit out in the usual way, proportional number of other customers have already selected that table. And the table tells you what branch to leave that node on. Okay? So the first customer arrives, there's a first branch, which is taken. The second customer may take that or not. There'll maybe be a second branch emerge, and there'll be a growing number of branches. So we have a variable out degree of that node. Okay? 
Go to the next node, whichever one you selected, and there again you have a Chinese restaurant. And you go and sit at a table, and that selects what branch to leave that thing from. And you generate an infinite path, making a sequence of selections here. So it's a nesting of Dirichlet processes, if you will, or nesting of Chinese restaurant processes. All right, so a little picture to make that a little more clear. A person comes in, they may select the first branch, they go down there, and they pick a selected branch, and so on. So it's a re reinforcement on paths in a tree kind of, kind of story. All right. Second customer may pick some of the same, and after four people have come in, four branches have been picked out of this infinite tree. Uh, now you put topics at every node, just by IID draws, maybe. Um, and so we have beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and so forth. That's a topic, which is a distribution of words. And now a document, the model for that, is a path down the tree. I get now, I pick the path down the tree, and then I use some probabilistic process to decide what level, and I generate a word from that topic. And then I keep the same path, and I pick another level and generate a word. Keep doing that up and down the path. And the path is infinite, so we use a stick breaking or something to make sure that you know, the, the probabilities decay as you go down the tree. And this generates documents. And if I were to hand put in an abstraction hierarchy, the and and up at the top, it'd be really smart. And then highly uh, frequent words, high in the tree, and so on, I would you know, get nice looking documents. And of course, the magic of Bayesian inference, you don't have to hand put that in. You just give this thing data, and the posterior distribution does that for you. All right, so that slide I showed earlier, right there, is just exactly that. It's fitting that model to a corpus, which is a collection of documents and articles from the Journal of the ACM. And, the of the um, and there are lots of other examples of these kind of graphs. They do come up. The word the end and of in this particular case didn't have to be stripped away as ad hoc function words. They just percolate up to the tree, top of the tree, because that's where Bayes wants to put it's the most useful place to put high frequency words, and then so on as you go down the tree. Um, okay, so that's now also being used, and I think we'll get more wide use as people develop more sophisticated search engines and so on in the industry. Um, so I hope you've seen that we have uh, made a little progress here, but we also backtracked in a very significant way. So I was not very happy with this um, model um, because it um, succeeded in giving you more interpretable topics, um, all right, but it only allows you one path down the tree. And if you look at those paths, I won't go back because you can't even see the words, but if you look at those paths, they're about one theme. There's kind of a sports branch. And there's very generic words like the and and of, and then the game, point, and so on, and then more specific words as you go further down the tree. Okay? All right? But that model would only pick one branch down the tree, could only generate a sports document. All right? Now it does it in a more sophisticated way, but it's still a limited representation of the documents. We're back to where we were before in the information retrieval literature that we so critiqued, which is we can only have one topic, when in this sense really more theme per document. All right, so the last development in that line of research, which I think is our state of the art, um, so for exchangeable models of documents, this I think is the best thing we have, I think it's actually uh, real progress, uh, is, an, is bringing together nesting and hierarchies. All right, so um, a nested hierarchy virtually process, and I'm, I'm not gonna get into details here, but it's really actually a pretty simple idea. Uh, it's that you didn't use the nested Dirichlet process to generate a, uh, a branching structure of some kind. Um, and then you use that as a base measure for HDP, for a hierarchical Dirichlet process. Uh, so you then get other trees which are perturbations off of that underlying tree. All right, so it's a, it's a clean uh, putting together of these two, what I think are big ideas in non-parametrics, nesting and hierarchies. Uh, I should say I gave this problem to um, first year students for quite some time. Um, uh, you know, not wanting to work on it myself because it seemed like a lot of programming to demonstrate the value of this. And it was not easy. And so several of them, you know, there was some several failures. And then uh, a Duke student, John Paisley, arrived and uh, made short work of this. Uh, has a very nice few uh, lead author on the paper that eventually appeared on this. That just appeared this year. Um, you know, so just to elaborate a little bit, uh, we would then get trees where they have a pure branch. An athlete has a good game, might be represented as one path down a document. But an athlete signs a new contract, has a little blend of finance and sports and the tree. The posterior distribution uh, would appear something like you see there on, on the right. Um, OK, so uh, that's about as far as we've taken DFINETI for now. Uh, there are some other things to do, and there's been lots of work on this. There are um, there's whole, whole, whole sub-conferences devoted to topic models and lots of creativity being shown. Um, but really, uh, most of them are DFINETI taken, you know, elaborated and elaborated. I think that's been really, really interesting. Um, okay, so let me say a little more about the computational imperative. Uh, 
So uh, it's only in the last couple of years where these things have really started to catch on in industry and uh, where people are really interested in large scale problems. And it's because we had to move beyond classical MCMC. That just was not cutting it. As I was alluding to earlier, people would walk away. We had this uh, alternative approach to MCMC, which I, uh, my earlier career spent a lot of time proselytizing about variational methods. They are still very much viable and, and definitely used. Uh, but they're a batch oriented technology too. If you have a large data set, they have to go through the whole data set multiple times. Um, you know, they're kind of likelihood based methods as well, and that's the problem. Uh, so there's been some developments recently. Uh, uh, Hoffman, Bly, Paisley, and Lang um, uh, developed it. So there's a, there's a hue and cry around stochastic gradient descent in the uh, more frequent story and machine learning literature. Um, so as you may know, you know gradient descent, uh, classical method for going downhill, um, has many favorable properties, not depending so much on the ambient dimensionality and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you have a loss function, which is the sum over many, many millions of things, even to take one step, you have to do millions of evaluations. That seems like a very costly thing to do. So the stochastic comes in where you simply you take that sum and you approximate it with just a few terms, or maybe in the limit just one term. And you get a very noisy estimate of the gradient now, but you had to go ahead and take it. That's you're like a drunk kind of walking down hill, but every step is so fast. Um, then you get down the hill much, much more fast and someone is carefully evaluating every term and taking these very, very slow steps. All right, so I didn't describe it maybe all that well, but that's been a huge change. I mean, there's been problems that were way out of range before with classical gradient where stochastic gradient has made all the difference. Hasn't been applied to Bayes, hardly at all, and really at all, uh, you know, that, is, that sort of insight, uh, until this paper on uh, stochastic variational inference. Um, so they need to turn the Bayesian problem into an optimization problem. That's what variational methods do. So they use the variational transformation. They um, you know, left Bayes behind, as far as I was concerned, in the following way. Uh, so you, they, they took a fixed posterior based on the whole corpus. So if I have a billion documents, I've got a posterior based on a billion entities. All right? I transform that into an optimization function and do stochastic gradient on that. Right. Now, stochastic gradient will take one document at a time and go downhill, so it kind of looks like it's streaming through the data. But it's not a streaming Bayesian algorithm in the sense of having a posterior that you update, as we've been alluding to earlier. That's one of the keys of Bayesian thinking. Um, instead, it has this fixed posterior that it's targeting, and it's making little steps on that. And eventually, we'll get to the bottom of that posterior. Right. Halfway through that process, you get kind of an odd thing, which is you've gone downhill on a posterior that you'll eventually get, you'll eventually have all the data for, but you don't have the data yet. And moreover, if you've arrived at the end of your corpus, and next day I give you some more documents, you're not clear what to do. All right. Anyway, I'm kind of uh, uh, demeaning it a little bit just to make the point clear conceptually that it's not you know, so Bayesian, but it has been wildly successful. It's been applied to many, many millions of document corpora, and it's been a real pro a bit of progress. So we followed that up with a paper just this year, um, Broderick, it's a lead author, camera. Uh, where we instead work, go back to more classical base. We have now not a fixed posterior we're targeting, we have a sequence of posteriors. Right? And we're going to still turn this into an optimization problem. The way we do that is we start with an arbitrary, uh, we start with a prior, and we apply a one data point variational update to that prior to turn it into an approximation of the posterior after one data point. And then we did do a variational update based on the next data point to turn that into an approximation of the posterior based on two data points. And so we have a sequence of variational approximations that link along this chain that are not going down to a fixed function, but are following a, uh, that Bayesian procedure. So it's a little bit more of the flavor of sequential Monte Carlo, but it is uh, blindingly fast compared to the stochastic algorithm. It is a deterministic algorithm. And then lastly, even more uh, fast, um, is this procedure called MAD Bayes. Uh, that is an acronym as well, but we titled that because it would make MAD Bayes mad. Um, it takes the marginal likelihood. It identifies scale parameters into it and sends them to zero asymptotically uh, in the uh, analysis, not in the computation. So you took a marginal thing, which is, usually we do this for non-parametric models, so you have a combinatorial term and a likelihood, you have a bunch of scale parameters, you send them to zero, get a new function, um, and you now hand that off to coordinate descent or some other optimization procedure, go down all that. That was motivated by the observation of k-means, widely used for clustering, still to this day, criticized forever, but still the most widely used cluster technique by far, um, can be gotten by taking a finite Gaussian mixture model, taking the sigma squared to zero, getting a function that you can do coordinate descent on. That's the k-means algorithm. 
Um, and so we did that same kind of procedure, we call this small grades asymptotics, to non Bayesian, uh, so non parametric, a little ellipsis there was not very really fortunate, non parametric Bayesian uh, mar uh, joint marginal probabilities, and for some of that. So that will fit um, some of the models we've been interested in about three orders of magnitude faster than MCMC. Um, so it's, it's uh, apples and oranges, sort of hard to say what you mean by fit and converge and all that. But that's sort of the right spirit. Um, so even though it's a deterministic procedure, it, it, it won't go downhill to a global optimum. You have to start it a couple hundred times, maybe to try to find a good optimum. It's still hundreds of times faster than MCMC. So it goes from not being practical to being practical. Uh, I view this as initialization procedures for MCMC. And I think that our, our, our community hasn't thought enough about that. If you look at related communities like numerical linear algebra, um, you know, after Gauss and so on and so on and so forth, there was a whole era where uh, people spent all their time on preconditioning. And you, people got great prizes for doing great preconditioning. It sounds boring, but that the literature got sophisticated because they moved beyond just the generic procedures to preconditioning to make the generic procedures work well in all cases and make them much, much faster. And I think our community too, we have great generic procedures, also needs to think about preconditioning or initialization, really fast, get to decent solutions, and then hone them in other ways. Anyway, if you go on and on about that topic. All right, so for our last uh, few minutes, or five, um, let me just say that, uh, that, that one wants to be really much more ambitious about uh, getting into uh, documents and understanding them and so on and so forth. Um, so one has to leave behind the Finetti, sadly, tear in the eye at this point, and try to think more deeply about how do you get representations that try to capture some notion of semantics, including relations and, and uh, negation and, um, and so on and so forth. And so this is a two-year project um, with Percy Liang, who's now a professor at Stanford, and Dan Klein, my colleague at, at Berkeley, where we spent quite a lot of time trying to think about representations that were probabilistic and trainable by data but also captured notions of natural language semantics. Um, and Dan is a, and Percy really are both linguists, um, and so we knew a little bit about what you know, that meant to be kind of a real semantic model. And the motivating kind of problem here was question answering. So it's not just search in Google, it's things like this. I type in, what's the largest city in California? All right, so that's a natural language question. And what comes back is sort of a lot of stuff, but basically, you know, I, I can extract out of that Los Angeles. All right, so search engines can do things like that. They're doing it in a dumb way but they can kind of do that. What if I type in, what's the largest city in California not including Los Angeles? Right. <laughs> you know, nonsense, and you all know this problem, right? But we could, we can get that, we can work on that. We can make progress, we can have a representation of not, and we can reason with that, and we can do that as Bayesians. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about project, we have a long paper on this that has this whole laid out, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about how we've done this. Um, so our problem is really a latent variable model problem. We wanna take in a sentence, and map it to San Diego. That's the, that's the second largest city. Uh, and in between, what's the thing in between? Well, it's some, we're not seeing that thing in between in the data. It's some latent structure, and we have to infer that. All right, so what is it? Well, we have hence a linguist have worked on things called logical forms, and they map these things into logical expressions of some kind. And there is an existing literature where people try to solve these problems you know, um, on the computer, and what they do is they assume for every question and every answer there is a for the human labeled a logical form. And they turn this into a big feature-based machine learning problem. Okay, this is how people work in industry. All right, so you need to hire lots and lots of humans to label lots and lots of logical forms. It's just all the problems we're used to just rock really large. All right? That's okay, but you're gonna hit a glass, you're gonna hit a ceiling pretty quickly. That's just not gonna work. So, um, all right, so briefly, here's what we do. It's graphical model technology but it's general in two ways. First of all, it's relational. So every node in the graph is actually a predicate that has fields. You know, the first field, the second field, the third field, and so on. So you match up nodes according to the field. So city has a field, uh, and location in you know, a city in a state has a first field, which is the city, and the second field, which is the state, and you connect this up like a little diagram, and we're gonna do Bayesian inference on this, or at least probabilistic inference. And so a representation of a sentence, a phrase, like sitting in a state border in California would have the border predicate, state predicate, location, and so on and so forth. And you can start to get pretty interesting clauses being remodeled, and, and, and actually which is trees, uh, sitting in a state border in California, which is traversed by a major river flowing through Arizona. So you, know, you can reason with these things and, and so on. So is, is this how, how far can we take this sort of thing? Uh, first of all, to note this is, a, this is a semantic structure, it's got predicates. 
but it aligns with the syntax. And so we build a system that does syntactic parsing, maps it to structures like this, and then reasons with the semantics. So um, the whole pipeline is being done in this project. Um, right, but then we got to figure out what it means. You know, that, that's a representation there, but what, you know, is it just a piece of uh, code on a computer? What does it actually mean? Well, you need to tie it to the real world, make it coherent with the real world by having a mapping with a lexicon, a you know, database that maps between um, the entities and your symbols in your program and the real world. And so we have a, a, so we put that together. We have the question, we have the program in the form I've just shown you, like that, and we have a database, and the two together go together, and then the two arrows come into a box which does probabilistic reasoning. Okay, just probabilistic reasoning. Uh, and so an example of that would be, you know, a city, a, you know, a certain city located in the state of California. We would have a database which has all the cities and has a location predicate, and then it reasons it by passing probabilities on the graphical model. Okay? And so the final interpretation, the meaning of a sentence, uh, is the set of values that a certain node takes on after you've done the probability propagation on this graph. That's the meaning of the sentence. Okay, how many cities are in California? Now we start to get more complicated. All right, that doesn't map to these expressions I've shown you here. Graphical models alone will not do that. All right, what do you need? Well, you, you need to have a count of a predicate. An object that takes in a set and gives you the numerosity of that set. That's just a predicate. We could put nodes like that in our graph. There's a count predicate. If you pass me the null set, I give you zero. If you pass me Oregon, I give you one. If I pass me one, four, I give you two. It's just a count predicate. It, it exists, be computed. But how do we put that in a graph? Well, it needs to operate on sets of solutions. So what you need is an abstraction operator that will take a subtree and not just take one solution for that, but which will take the set of all solutions to that. Really a distribution. All right? And then it will operate on the set. So this operator then takes a subtree and gives you a set from that. So this is where it goes from predicate, sort of propositional to first order logic. This is a set version of, prop of, of first order logic. I'm about to close here, but I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of the flavor um, of this. Once you put these abstraction operators in there, you can do some wonderful things. So if I want to say how many cities there are in California, I just have cities in California. I, I, I reify that as a set. I get all the cities in California, and then I give that to the count predicate, and it counts them. And now I can do things like every city in California has a river. Okay? So I just have all the cities in California. I have things that are traversed by a river. And I ask if this set here is contained in this set here. That's every set-based logic. All right? I can do no city in California has a river. No is a really hard word in linguistics. It's the hardest word. Um, but this is just means there's an empty intersection of two set logic nodes. All right, so we really are building up to a Bayesian way to think about natural language semantics, and one that can be actual, you know, posterior inference based on some data. I think I had one on superlatives as well, where you have argmax instead of count as one of the nodes in this in abstraction graph. All right, so um, to finish up, let me give some actual results. So this was built uh, by Percy as part of his thesis, and it was so impressive that he was hired by Google for a year to implement this inside Google before he took his professor job at Stanford. And he did that, and we'll see what happens. And it's being discussed inside of Google what they're going to do with it. Um, but here's, uh, here's some of the excitement around this. Uh, here's one of the standard semantic benchmarks. So they have benchmarks in this field. It's actually quite an exciting subfield. Uh, they've really thought some this through the testing issues. So here's an example. Uh, they have a benchmark, which is the geography benchmark. It's just a bunch of geography facts. There are certain rivers or certain cities or certain states and borders and so on and so forth. And then they want to ask questions of things like, what's the highest point in Florida? How many states have a city called Rochester? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the systems that have been built to do this do the thing I told you earlier. For each sentence, they have a human give you a logical form, and then they train that up in some machine learning kind of way. Not very satisfying. Our system uh, will take in those things, and the training data is just the answer. What's the highest point in Florida? You have to have a human say Walton County on some training data. Not on all the data. We're going to predict. Uh, how many states have a city called Rochester? It turns out to be two. And so on and so forth. So we have a few, well, 600 such examples. And you can get that with one human spending half a day. Okay. Here's an empirical comparison on doing this on this thing. So there's been several papers going back to 01, 05. And there's a literature where people have been studying this, and they have a variety of systems built. Uh, the best system up to this point has a test set accuracy of 87.9%. That was in 2010. Uh, this paper, um, 
Yeah, so I should say, all those previous results were done by hand labeling of logical forms. Very labor intensive. The new system uh, was at that time uh, the best uh, system on this database in the world, and I, I think that's still true, 93.6%. Uh, uh, here's another uh, benchmark that's used, I think it's really great. Uh, 500 training examples. Um, what jobs give me 40,000 to work in Houston on internet and web with Perl? Uh, if you can answer questions like that, that's really, really, really great. I mean, just based on facts, you know, no, you're not building any of these things. What jobs pay 60,000 do not require a PhD? All right, so I hope you'll agree that if you can answer questions like this, there's some intelligence behind that. All right, so here was the existing results on this hard benchmark. Um, most of the work was done quite a while ago, there were papers in 2005, getting about 80% accuracy, and the new system is up there. All right, so this is a real success story, I think, for, um, for probabilistic inference, thought about in a new graphical model representation that includes abstraction. Okay. This is definitely not the end of the day. This is a field which is just getting going. Right? So in my role as you know, what's the future, uh, this is an area which is a clear future. I mean, you may have read the other day that Mark Zuckerberg is now creating a new lab with a few hundred people um, that is going to work on problems like that. So they call it AI, whatever you want to call it. It's inference with data that's relevant to humans. That's really what it's about. It's not about creating artificial humans, which is the old dream of AI is creating systems that can interact with humans based on data. And that's what we as a community should be heavily engaged in. This should be left to the computer scientists. All right, so I'm done. Um, so this was meant to be an applied statistics talk. All right, I hope it came across that way. Uh, so this document modeling, which is the thing I started to work on when I went from uh, MIT to Berkeley. And why did I go from MIT to Berkeley, by the way? Because there was no statistics at MIT, and there was a tradition on the West Coast in Berkeley. That attracted me. So that's why I moved there. And this problem seemed to the right one to start to deploy um, uh, Bayesianism, uh, even in the Berkeley context. And I should add, by the way, Berkeley has been very friendly to me as a Bayesianist. Uh, my <coughs> class has had many, many dozens of students take the classes, and the colleague, my colleagues like it. Uh, there's really in the statistics world a uh, feeling if it works, great. Um, it really is a feeling also at Berkeley. Um, so anyway, uh, this particular topic, document modeling, you know, had some obvious problems with existing literature and some ways to proceed, and that's just how it goes with applied statistics. You know, pick a good problem that everyone's already beating on. You know, no more sparsity for this and this and this. You know, work on something else. Um, uh, you will discover things, and they will probably be useful to people in related areas. Whether they go to the core of Bayesian statistics or not, I don't know. I don't really care. I don't know what the core is, but they will be useful. Um, so hopefully Bayesian will continue to lead in such areas, um, right? And the last kind of slightly negative comment, we have to take this big data issue seriously, right? Computation, however you want to express it. We have to have a notion of runtime as part of the core of our of statistical field. So I've given this sort of talk uh, to the more frequentist people. I say in, in minimax decision theory, your lower bounds have to refer to runtime. If they don't, they're just not going to be meaningful in the real world. And to the Bayesians, we don't sort of care about many max low bounds so much, but we have to start to have, and runtime just can't be add plus lambda times runtime. Because runtime is a hard thing to think about. That's what comp computational complexity tries to do in their worst case non probabilistic way. We have to develop another parallel computational complexity theory of more adaptive statistics. Mm -hmm. So on that note, I'm finished, and I thank you for a great day. For a couple questions. Anyone? Ed? So it, it feels like this, the last language, natural language processing, is really about how a child might learn a language. I mean, you have the syntax there, and there are plenty of examples. So would psychologists be interested in thinking of this as a sort of primitive model for language acquisition? Yeah, they would. So our, the question is, are psychologists really be interested in this? And yeah, this is going to be a long-term, many-century collaboration between psychologists and statisticians and others. This is even hard problems that people started in the 40s and 50s to try to address. I mean, the early decision theorists were interested in psychology, right? Um, but the problems are really, really hard, and they require data to be available to sort of do these things. You may know another example of a natural language translation, all right? So if you go to Google and you type in an Italian phrase, that will come some butchered English. But it's not so bad. It's gotten better and better and better. You know, almost damn good when we were going from between English and, any, and sort of 60 languages. What's under the hood there? Really dumb statistics that has nothing to do with how children learn. Kind of counts and how many times this phrase occurred and this phrase occurred together and some shrinkage and blah, blah. 
Nothing like human learning. Will it get to the moon? Will it, will it solve the problem? Well, yeah, no. Eventually, it'll, it'll, it'll top out. It'll be maybe useful for lots of applications, but it won't be, you won't like turn it on to teach your child something. It won't interact with humans in a deep way. So to solve that problem, we have to think about the brain, the mind, the personalist perspective of Bayesian will help, but it's not everything. Humans operate in real time. And again, if Bayesians don't take real time seriously, we're not going to do psychology right. Uh, humans operate in social context. If we don't have the context of the, all the good news in mind when we think about the human, we're not going to get the individual process of, of working with data. And language is all about social connectivity. Um, so these are super challenging problems. You know, if anyone thinks the field is done, no, it's just getting started. Jose? Just to uh, give us uh, five minutes or two minutes of thought, uh, how do you think it would be the best way to proceed in automatic translation? And can you more or less transfer directly what you have done in English into another language? You go to a word to word translation first. How do you do it? No, good question about how do you actually do translation right. So the dream of ling linguists for a long, long time has been this mother semantic language that all of us probably have in our heads, right? And so um, uh, this is not how it's being done now, but that's how the field eventually will have to do it. You will map English. I'm listening to you speaking English. I map that into some semantic representation. And if I turn to Sonia and say, you know, and say it in Italian, uh, I'm going to be going not from your English directly to the Italian. I'm going to go through this intermediate representation. That's been a dream for a long time, and it's just not happened yet because it's so hard. It's so hard. So this little piece of work is one little piece of step, and there's a whole field called natural language processing. They have their own conferences where they work on this, and there are real experts there. I'm not. Um, but they really work on this very, it's full of statistics, by the way, Bayesian and not. And it's a, it's a, they call it statistical natural NLP. They don't even call it NLP anymore because it's so pervaded by statistics that it's not even, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Um, but that problem is really, really one of the mother of all problems. We just never face problems quite that hard. What does it mean to have a representation of the world and to manipulate it, have relations and, and so on and so forth and to think like this? Uh, but that's the way it has to eventually go. You can't just map between languages in the surface syntax. It has to do with the underlying semantics of how you manipulate this. Uh, so again, I think of those as statistical problems because they involve inference and data and, uh, and losses and so on and so forth. But it has to be in cooperation with the people who care about the linguists. And it will involve semantics. So this, by the way, I just not the this little piece of work will not do that. This is a first step in answering little factoid type questions. It gives an answer like San Diego. It doesn't give out long answers. You can't do that. And you may have read about Watson, which tries to do even simpler kind of things in some way, answer Jeopardy questions. Uh, it's not really using much semantics, and it has very very shallow coverage. Yeah. So another big data uh, challenge in medicine is that. Uh, and we can be phrased that can statistically be used to cure cancer. What I mean is that now there are efforts to try to collect big database yeah. and with all the uh, medical information, genomic information, treatment yeah. and outcome. So suppose this uh, knowledge database continues to evolve and get better, then the question is, you know, can yeah. you identify effective treatments to cure cancer? What's yeah, that's one of the big data problems over here, certainly. Yeah. But that's one more that you know, statistics has been very aware of and is really focused on. I mean, all the work on false discovery rates, and you name it from your own perspective, has been about trying to make sure that out of these huge databases, you don't give crappy advice, that's right. So, right? And that's what we should focus on for sure. But then at some point, all these procedures, like FDR and the Bayesian version of that, add extra computational load on a system, right? And if you don't take that into account, you will find people not using the ideas because they can't afford it. So we've done some work on this actually with Bootstrap. And you run some procedure and get an estimate. You don't want to put an error bar on that. That takes a certain amount of time. Then you want to do diagnostics on that. Takes yet more time. And if that whole chain from here to here doesn't run in a few milliseconds, people will turn off the latter part. They'll just go with the best guess the system will give, not doing good statistics. So again, we have to be worried about the real time aspects of the decision making. For some problems like astronomy or whatever, or you know, real medical advances, you want to take your time. Right? But there always is some notion of time pressure. And you have to worry about scale. Can I do control of family-wise or whatever other kind of error rates at scale? Is my procedure actually, at, when we're done with millions of records and you know, high-dimensional spaces, is actually good in that scale and attractable? Uh, so we don't really think very much about that. But um, yeah, there's lots of big data problems. There's not one big data problem. But it is, it is a nice buzzword which captures the spirit of the era. We want to make decent decisions for lots of people on large collections of data that are streaming in. 
and we as a field have to take that seriously. So let's um, stop there and thank Mike again, and thank you to Bob.